Hello, can everyone hear me? Awesome. Sorry, my camera's a little fuzzy. Um, my name is Nakasuk Alokia, but a lot of you know me as Nak. I am a PhD student at Concordia University who contributed to this catalog and want to demonstrate a hudlik lighting quickly before we start. The hudlik is really important because a lot of our special events and our ceremonies start with lighting the hudlik. So even, to, even though we're doing this virtually this year, it's important that we maintain this tradition of keeping Inuit culture and tradition strong. I'm from Kingai myself, so I have a personal connection to the community and with the textiles, it was really an honor to be able to work with them. Um, it's also really an honor to be doing this hudlik lighting because I know how important it is. Uh, to start, I'll show you just a little bit about the hudlik. So you have your, your stone vessel and inside you put, I have some olive oil, but you can technically use any oil. Traditionally, it was whale oil. And you mix it with some Arctic cotton here, which is this. Like it grows in little bogs and swampy areas and you collect it in the summer and fall and you can um, save it for the winter. Um, this is actually pretty old so it lasts a long time. And you also mix it with some sod. This was really important in Inuit culture because it was not only used to help light the hundik but it was used on top of the sod houses. So this was, the sod is really important in Inuit culture. And you mix it together and you create this little line where you, it's like a wick. Uh, a lot of you see, have seen cotton wicks. So this is like a traditional Inuit wick and you light it with flint or um, any other implement. I'm gonna use a lighter just cause it's quick and convenient. The hulik is also important because not only was the soot and the heat important for cooking and eating and keeping your, your home warm, but the, the soot was used for tattooing. So there was, the hulik has a lot of meaning and a lot of significance in a lot of different Inuit communities. And I'm really happy that I can share what I know. I know it's not a complete history, but it's, it's good to know, know this and share it so you can also know and share it with your friends. So I am gonna use my stick and my lighter to light the hulik and hopefully it will be quick and easy. <laughs> Sometimes it's not. <laughs> The trick is to keep it damp but not wet and dry enough that it doesn't smoke. So I have been playing with this a little bit today. So you can tell I've been, I kind of prepped it in preparation for this. And you can see, because I prepped it, it's a lot easier to light. Earlier this morning, it took me about 15 minutes to get it right. <laughs> I can only imagine how hard it must have been to try and do this in the winter or, um, in a igloo and without a lighter, like with flint. Can you all see it? Now that the hulik is lit, I'm going to keep it lit throughout the whole time I am here. Um, I might have to leave a little early because I have kids, but I will stick, along, stick around as long as I can. Hello, everyone. I'm Emma Quinn, the Executive Director of the Textile Museum of Canada. And on behalf of our board and staff, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Nak, for lighting of the ceremonial kulik and celebration of today's catalog launch. It was a beautiful ceremony. The land on which the Textile Museum of Canada operates is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. 
and is now home to many diverse nations, Inui and Métis peoples. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work here and through our activities seek to create a space for people from within and outside our community to share, learn, and celebrate the textile practices of today and long ago in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I am so pleased and excited that we're gathered here today to launch the exhibition catalog for printed textiles from Knight Studios. As much as I wish that we could be together celebrating this publication at the museum in the presence of the beautiful textiles, I'm grateful that through video conference, we can bring voices and people together from far afield to mark this occasion. As stewards of this important collection of textiles, the Textile Museum is committed to ongoing research, knowledge sharing, and to offering community access to these works. The catalog, published in three languages, contributes incredible scholarship and includes great essays, wonderful images of textiles, engages the voices of community members, and pays tribute to the artists and printmakers from 60 years ago. We are greatly indebted to the writers whose research and experience are reflected in these pages. In the months leading up to the exhibition, we welcomed active engagement with the Inuit art community, which yielded many rich connections and insights. The exhibition has been much enriched by the generous contributions of so many people throughout the year, Inuit artists, designers, scholars, and community members were welcomed into our space to view the fabrics. And Roxanne Shaughnessy traveled to Knight to meet community members and share the project. The depth and level of research reflected in this project would not be possible without the contributions of many. We are so grateful for the support of the Government of Canada through the Department of Canadian Heritage Museums Assistance Program. In addition to key program support through the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council and the Government of Ontario. We are pleased to have BMO Financial Group as our leading presenting sponsor for our 2019 and 20 exhibition program. And we are thankful for the philanthropic support of the William R. and Shirley Beatty Charitable Foundation, the Shrivers, and the Sharp Indigenous Charitable Trust. We extend our de deepest gratitude to the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative and Dorset Fine Art for entrusting the collection to the Textile Museum of Canada and thank Pelusi Kamagik, president of West Baffin Eskimo Co-op and William Huffman, marketing manager of Dorset Fine Art for their continued support. In just a few moments, you will hear from Will and we will bring greetings from Pelusi who is unfortunately unable to join us today. I'm also pleased to introduce senior curator and manager of the collection, Roxanne Shaughnessy and our curatorial project coordinator, Alex Holm who will lead us through many parts of today's launch. Roxanne, Alex, thank you for your energy that you brought to this project and for producing such an amazing catalog. Congratulations. And as a final note, I'd like to just encourage any other guests today that want to ask questions to place them into the Q&A and we'll do our best to address all of them as we get towards the end of the presentation. So thank you and Roxanne, or Will, I guess, Will. <laughs> A big virtual thank you, Emma, and I too miss hanging out with you guys and visiting the museum. Hopefully we can do this in the in the months to come eventually. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with the Textile Museum and particularly on this really remarkable project. Um, now, once again, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Emma uh, Paluzzi uh, can't be with us today. There were a few workplace urgencies that intervened at the last minute, but I, I also suspect that it's the large pod of beluga whales that are currently off the uh, the beach of uh, Kinite, um, which always takes a priority when the whales are in town. I can tell you it's been a really successful hunting uh, the last couple of days. I think they caught four uh, to date. So um, there's a lot of, uh, of beluga for the community at the moment. Um, and uh, Paul did ask that we present his remarks in absentia. And I, I think we can probably put those on the screen and everybody can give it a read.
And, and I think we're going to go to a quick video, a, a one minute video, just a, an introduction to the to the history of the West Baton Eskimo Cooperative. Kingate Studios of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative has produced many iconic Inuit creations. Its drawing, printmaking, and sculpture have defined excellence in the genre. The studio's rich history also includes two lesser known but equally unique endeavors. Active in the late 1960s, a textile program at Kingate Studios adapted drawings and prints into patterned fabric for apparel and household use. And in 1977, Kingate Press was launched, and in that year, it would create the Inuit world. 26 pages of text accompanies an original print by the legendary Kananganak Pudigut. Each edition was hand printed on a typography press in Kenite. Resourceful, experimental, and always with a few surprises, the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative's legacy of innovation in Inuit art lives on. Well, thanks very much. I, I'm glad we were able to take a look at that. It, it's part of eight videos that we are producing, uh, commissioned by the Canadian High Commission in London uh, to promote the history of, of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative. And uh, we've been getting lots and lots of traction. So stay tuned for the rest of those that will be coming out soon. And I will make sure that Paluzzi uh, in absentia gets a warm uh, uh, thank you for his welcome and his remarks. And, uh, and as far as I'm concerned for me, I'm gonna be brief since there are so many way more interesting speakers this afternoon, I can assure you, I will be the least interesting of all of them. Um, and now, as many of you know, this whole project, which is now a massive, massive undertaking, began so humbly from a series of storage boxes discovered at the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative offices in, in Kenite and in Toronto. Um, it became a terrifically successful exhibition, um, which if you haven't seen, you should, and hopefully we will be able to visit museums in the, in the weeks to come. Um, and, and I've been told that the exhibition will travel to other venues in Canada. So this is an amazing opportunity for uh, those across the country to see this. Um, and of course, uh, what's happening today is this historic publication. So it's so exciting to see this project grow exponentially from, from its, its early stages, the, the grain of, of the idea that we had and, and that the, the Textile Museum um, so graciously uh, uh, expanded upon. So congratulations to Textile, Textile Museum team, Emma, Roxanne, Alexandria, and everyone who continues to, to contribute to this on going project. Now, a quick thing about the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative. For more than six decades, um, we've been providing the creative resources to our Inuit artist members, enabling the production of Kenite's iconic drawings, prints, and sculpture. Since its beginnings, the cooperative is a community-owned organization governed by a fully Inuit board of directors, and almost all the residents uh, of, of Cape Dorset, uh, Kenite, um, own shares in the company. So it's truly a community initiative, really quite a remarkable story. Um, the, organization, the organization operates the oldest fine art print studio in Canada, and each fall since 1959, we release a superb collection of prints. This year, the collection was launched on the 19th of September and has been, as expected, wildly popular. Now, in 1978, the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative Board realized its vision of establishing a Toronto location, which continues to manage the distribution of artwork, outreach, communications, advocacy, and maintains local, national, and international partnerships, like certainly this unique relationship that we have with the, with the Textile Museum. Um, and now about this particular relationship, uh, Textile Museum of Canada has truly embraced this little or lesser known part of Kenite history and has painstakingly researched the origins and mined the details of this fascinating printed textile uh, initiative. And evidence of that research can be found from cover to cover in the wonderful publication that we're launching today. 
Um, the gravitas and momentum the museums created around this project has truly celebrated the West Bath and Eskimo cooperative relationship to textile. And that narrative now becomes another part of the organization's remarkable history. So for that, thank you, thank you, and thank you again. And I hope that we continue to work on these amazing projects and celebrate this amazing history of creation in, in, in Canada's Arctic. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to celebrate the launch of the catalog with all of you. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Emma, Pelosi, and Will for your remarks. It has been a great honor to partner with the West Bath and Eskimo Cooperative on this project. And we appreciate your collaboration throughout this process and look forward to sharing the publication with the Knight community. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Heather Iguoliarte, our project advisor. Heather holds the Tier 1 University Research Chair in Circumpolar Indigenous Arts and is an Associate Professor in the Department of Art History at Concordia University in Montreal. She also leads the SHIRT Partnership Grant, Inuit Futures in Arts Leadership. Heather has shared her deep knowledge throughout her role as project advisor, bringing her broad experience curating Inuit art to the project. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Roxanne, Unasakut, everyone. I, I just uh, really thrilled to be here and to be a part of celebrating the launch of this fantastic catalog. So uh, beautifully printed and well-researched. When you invited me to be a part of this project uh, it's over a year ago now, I was just uh, so thrilled to, to come into the Textiles Museum. Remember when we could all go and <laughs> visit places together and to get to see behind the scenes and uh, get really up close with these beautiful, beautiful textiles. I'm uh, so thrilled that they have been found and that they will now uh, be forever recognized and celebrated for what incredible impact they had over such a short period of time in our history. Uh, as you said, I, I just an advisor on this project. I, I was thrilled to um, be a consultant and to uh, review the catalog text and, and get to participate a little bit in some of the other events that have happened over the course of this exhibition's run. And I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the real highlights for me was the uh, getting to come to Toronto and be present for the talk that Nakusak gave at uh, the Textiles Museum in, oh gosh, I don't even know when that was anymore. Was it September? <laughs> was it October? Like, time has lost all meaning. But <laughs> that, that presentation was uh, not just a highlight of this exhibition, but probably a highlight for me uh, of talks that I've ever seen given because Nak, being a, being a young person from that community and having uh, that deep oral history that comes from the familial connections that go through generations, it was unlike anything I've ever seen before, because while it was, of course, grounded in her uh, excellent academic standing, it was also very personal. And the stories were based in uh, the lived reality of growing up in Cape Dorset and having family from Kenite and, and uh, knowing those stories and histories and having them be a part of her community knowledge. And so I think that uh, it was incredibly thrilling to see this uh, exciting new generation of Inuit art historians who are coming up now and taking up space and uh, demonstrating how much that they have to offer to this field. So it's a thrill for me to be involved in this project, but uh, I'm especially glad to see someone like uh, Nakusak come in and, and share that knowledge for um, really the enrichment of the field and our, our area of study. So uh, thank you so much again for having me be involved in this project. I, I've, I'll also note today, I, I put on some of my Inuit textiles and wearing a BB Shemitz cardigan and I've got Taralik's uh, gorgeous polar bear earrings on today in her honor. I'm so excited about everyone on the call and all that might come out of this. I hope that it really does, uh, like with Hanani and like with Martha Kayak and all the other amazing uh, fashion <laughs> designers that are working today, it's a incredibly exciting time to be um, involved in Inuit art. So thank you, Roxanne, and thank you, everyone. Nakami. Thank you, Heather. The catalog which accompanies the exhibition Printed Textiles from Knight Studios tells the story of the remarkable hand printed textile initiative that took place in Knight Studios during the 1950s and 60s. Next. 
The printed fabrics on view in the exhibition and beautifully illustrated in the book designed by Rob Gray are a physical record of a short-lived experiment undertaken in the early days of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative when Knight's now famous print program was just beginning. Elements of the story of this printing initiative were revealed to the voices of many, and I thank them for their valuable contributions. Individuals from the North and the South were invited to view the fabrics and have generously shared memory stories and guidance. Next. Tonight you will hear from the catalog contributors who collectively shine a light on the fabric printing enterprise. Next bringing their own unique perspectives on the place and importance of these printed textiles in the history of Inuit cultural heritage. Next. Now, let's go back to 2016 and I'll tell you how the Textile Museum got involved. In November of that year, curatorial director Sarah Quinton and I, along with former staff member Anna Richard, were invited to Dor Dorset Fine Arts by William Huffman, marketing manager, to view a recently rediscovered collection of textiles. With our curiosity peaked, we made our way over to the DFA offices and arrived to find dozens of pieces of printed cloth featuring patterns by well-known Kenite artists. Produced over 60 years ago, designs by Pudla Pudlat, Pitsalakashuno, Parr and others remain vibrant, engaging and expressive of the deeply felt connection between the artists and their environment. We were immediately drawn to learn more about the story behind the cloth. In 2017, the Textile Museum reached an agreement with our project partner, the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, and the collection of nearly 200 textiles was transferred to the Textile Museum as a long-term loan, and the research begun. Supported with funding from Museum's Assistance Program of Canadian Heritage, we began visualizing the exhibition catalog from the beginning involving the Knight community has been essential in the development of the project. I was fortunate to visit Knight in 2018 and again in 2019 with Alexandria Holm. Through community gatherings and informal conversations, I was able to share our research and images of the fabrics with community members who brought valuable new insights. After seeing images of the 60 year old fabrics for the first time, with designs by 16 artists identified to date, several participants recognized works made by their relatives and spoke with enthusiasm about their family members. Next. Knight studio artist Johnny Pudaguk was deeply touched to discover his father, Kanangana, had been the lead printmaker of the textile printing enterprise, something he had not known. Others generously shared memories and observations that helped to unfold and document the story of these textiles. Initial experiments to block print fabrics with Inuit designs were initiated in 1956 and printmaking introduced in 1957 by John Houston, an artist and civil administrator for the region in order to encourage handicraft production for sale in the South during the period when social change had disrupted traditional language and relationships to the land. Fabric printing experiments were promoted by Terry Ryan, who was hired as arts advisor of the WBEC in 1960 in, in, effort, in an effort to develop a marketable product. We learned that the designs themselves were typically crafted by the printmakers, led by Kanagana Pudigu, who selected motifs from drawings artists brought to the co-op for sale and translated them into patterns for yardage production. Next. Parr's Proud Geese, screen printed on cotton sateen twill on the right, demonstrates the effective use of a single graphic image repeated in vertical columns in alternate colors to create a striking design. In this example, a design by, by Panachi is hand printed on an unbleached cotton, lightly using a stencil and brush technique probably produced before the printmakers adopted the more efficient silkscreen method in 1963. In this experimental piece, the printmaker's hand is visible. There are smudges of colorant and some of the repeat designs are unevenly placed, indicating a process of trial and error as printmakers persevered to produce a marketable product. This on the left is the actual silk screen used to print fabrics beginning in 1963. 
including this printed fabric sample on the right, which is in the Loan Collection. Beginning in 1966, the textiles were marketed across Canada, then won Design 67 Award and were present at Expo 67. However, in 1968, printing ceased in Canite due to poor sales and designs were licensed out and printed in the South, which continues today. Fabrics and clothing with printed designs continue to represent the stories, landscapes, and lives of Inuit today. Inuit artists are creating brands that blend traditional Inuit clothing with modern contemporary fashion and creating new, new and innovative ways to represent Inuit culture. We invited three fashion designers, Tara Lip Duffy of Ugly Fish, Martha Kriak of Inukshik, and Nukes Lindell of Hanani Design to create works for the exhibition inspired by the Kanite fabrics. And the legacy of the textile printing initiative is explored through their work. And you'll hear from them in a bit. I hope that these lines of inquiry and research directions that are explored in the catalog will be picked up by others in the future to ensure the place and importance of these printed textiles in the history of Inuit cultural heritage is fully recognized. Now we will hear from other contributors whose research and writing add layers to the story and illuminate this essential part of the history of Kanite Studio. Anna Richard is co-author of our essay, Printed Textiles from Kanite Studios. Anna will share the research sources that she accessed that will provide a foundation for future research. Um, it's my first time being on this side of a Zoom <laughs> webinar, so it's an interesting experience. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and um, I'm grateful to be speaking to you today from unceded Mi'kmaq territory in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I was lucky to be involved in this project from the beginning. And as Roxanne just mentioned, we really saw it as an opportunity from the beginning uh, to do research that in the future others could build on and also poke holes in and reinterpret and interrogate. Uh, so I wanted to use my time today to share a little bit of um, information about the resources that I found the most useful. So um, I started researching the textiles before going to Dorset Fine Arts in 2016 to see the textiles. And I came across just a few footnotes um, and sentences about them. The general idea was that there was an attempt at a hand printed textile industry, but that it had failed. Uh, and then we had the experience of going to Dorset Fine Arts and seeing the fabric and they didn't look like a failure by any measure. They were interesting, they were technically well done, and they were beautiful. So that really provided motivation to dig in deeper into this story. Um, so I started by looking at the Library in Canada, our Library and Archives Canada um, on their image search. And um, this is where I started to get information and a lot of questions about who was involved, when this was happening, and how, how the textiles were being produced. Uh, so the first collection here is the Rosemary Gilead Eaton Fawns. Um, and a photo like this really started to give a sense of the time frame. So it's dated to 1960. The curtains in the background um, provide a sense of kind of an early design, quite different from a lot of what we see in the collection and also use, intended use. So it's hung in a home here as curtains. Uh, we can switch to the next photo, uh, which is just another from the same collection providing another uh, a, a different design, but also same time frame, same use of the, the textiles as curtains. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, I also looked at the National Film Board fawns. Uh, so this photo is from one year prior, from 1959. So it's really in the early experimental phase. And this gave us a little bit of a clue about how these textiles were being produced. So we see the artists and printers using stencils. Uh, and also, when you look closely at this, you can see some of these images that I think uh, form the basis for complete designs in the future. So starting to see, um, to see those there. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, also, the Charles Gimple fonts. Uh, so this photo is from later, from 1966. And in the caption, it says, Kaningana at work. Um, 
So when the cooperative really decided to invest in the textile printing program in 1963, a recent graduate from OCAD University, Olga Tchaikovsky, visited the studios in Kenai uh, to share information about silk screening on textiles. And she worked very closely with Kenangana because he was taken with this progress process, but also very successful. Uh, and he became a key figure in the development and all of the successes that we found in this project. I also spent a lot of time doing things like zooming in on the labels uh, of the cans in the background, trying to get a sense of what they were using to make these textiles. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, so I also had the chance to visit Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa uh, and the Arts Council funds really helped me build out information on the timeline, uh, on the progress of the project and the challenges that the artists and printers faced. So I pulled a couple of quotes that I found to illustrate the type of information I was finding. So at the top, there's a telegraph about Kaningana working on drapes and using textile paint. So kind of in the experimental phase, the early phase of the project, and also showing that Kaningana was involved from that very early point. Uh, the next one down is in 1965, when the textiles are starting to find some success. They're taking the shape that we see in the collection. Um, at the museum, and that's demonstrated here from interest from the Eden's department store in carrying the fabrics as bedspreads and cushions and draperies. And then the final quote on this slide is um, from a council meeting where they were discussing uh, a story that was pr printed in a Vancouver newspaper about a non-Inuit textile printing project that was falsely claiming Inuit origin. So, um, I think that that kind of was raising alarm bells at that point. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, so as Roxanne mentioned, we also were looking into the Design 67 Industrial Design Awards. Um, we knew that the textiles had won some of these awards because there were tags on a few of them, but we really didn't know what they were. So by looking into the archives, I was able to get a sense of it as a program that was intended to increase the production and sale of Canadian made goods ahead of Expo 67. Uh, and also learned that the Kinite textiles were selected for one of 58 awards and uh, they won a thousand dollar prize and they were chosen out of thousands of entries. Um, so really an endorsement of what an incredible project this was. Um, and then also that's where we got more information about uh, the textiles being used to decorate a model suite in Habitat at Expo 67. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, I also spent a lot of time going through newspapers from the period when the textiles were being produced and marketing. And this is really where we were able to find a lot of the names of the artists uh, and printers who were involved also information on marketing and who, um, who they were actually hoping would buy the textiles and then licensing of the designs out for fashion collections like you see on the right here. Uh, so I hope this kind of gives a sense of the pleasure that I took in doing this research. Um, I was so grateful to have been a part of it and I think through the work of everyone who was involved with this, it's really redefined the story um, of these artists and these printers. So it's no longer just a footnote. It's no longer something you could characterize as a failure, but it's a living story of innovation and creativity. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, your significant contributions of original research to the project really brought to light important information about the enterprise and will certainly uh, guide research, uh, the path of future research. So thank you. I was very fortunate to interview Jimmy Manning twice in Kanite, once in 2018 and again in 2019 with Alex Holm. Uh, Jimmy lives in Kanite and was formerly manager of the printmaking studios beginning in 1971. And soon after the fabric printing production ceased and designs were being licensed out in the South. These are a few clips from the interview which is featured in full in the catalog. 
where he shares his memories of printing during this time. I started in 71, so um, uh, I will start there. I okay. 69 and 60, uh, I wasn't there, so it, things were changing then from 1960 when we got to 71 because in, in, in that year uh, we were starting to um, getting into more different method of making prints like lithography right um, in mid 70s and and then finding more different um, uh, materials they, they always try to uh, experiment with different techniques and stuff like that. So they tried seal skin stenciling, which didn't really work out either. Uh, cut out, a certain cut out uh, almost worked at the time. And then we ran into a situation where paper was not, hard paper uh, wasn't really working because it, it, it only produced one or two images and that's it. And, uh, and the cutout lines start to get uh, warped and uh, damaged. And I remember we tried to come up with, uh, to try and correct the problem. So we uh, we then tried um, waxing the paper. Right. right. And then it really worked out uh, to our need. So we made our own, um, uh, waxing copper board with a little heater underneath. Right. And then we burned the, the candle, the ordinary candle of the copper when it gets hot. Mm -hmm. And then we would, we would sponge that over the um, mylar, the hard, harder paper. In our time, we were hardly working together with the artists, except them working all the time at home. Mm -hmm. It was, we started to, and they, to see if they were willing to come to the studios uh, and work that environment mm -hmm. as some really liked the idea because they didn't want to get interrupted by their small kids uh, pouring water or damaging the drawing while she went for a cigarette mm -hmm. and all that. So um, that was our goal to have. We wanted them closer to us because we were always working with their images right. so we can ask them directly uh, uh, in the studio. Right. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Alex and I want to say thank you to uh, Roxanne and Jimmy. Um, although he could not attend this launch, we again ex extend our thanks to him for his interview. Um, an important testimony from Jimmy Manning's thoughts and experience in the studios is now published in this catalog, which is quite fantastic. Um, and I want to introduce to you our next speaker, Martha Kiak. You might already be familiar with her fashion brand, uh, Inukshik, which fuses traditional with modern Inuit designs and styles. Martha is originally from Mitapintalik, um, which is indicated um, uh, in this region, um, the, the most north red dot on this map of Nunavut here. Um, however, she is now based in Ottawa, where she teaches Inuit history and language courses at Nunavut Sivanaksivut, an affiliate of Al Algonquin College. Martha holds a BA in education from McGill University and she is a self-taught artist. Last summer, Martha was interviewed for this catalog and she elaborated on some of her experiences and influences and created a stunning dress for this exhibition. 
inspired by the King Knight fab uh, fabrics. Um, so um, welcome, Martha. I think she's going to elaborate a little bit more herself now. Thank you. Um, uh, it was uh, an honor to be asked to be part of this uh, King 8 um, art um, fabric to, 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 be invited, and to be invited to the museum and see all these collections was a great honor. I was um, very happy to see them and I was so inspired. And I teach Nunavut Sivudik Savut and I teach Inuit history. So I do a lot of research and interview elders and other professors that know about Inuit. And um, when you look at the Inuit art in the early beginnings, you can see how everything they did was connected. They were connected to the sun, the birds, and there's a story behind in everything. And the, the other slide is also the connection that you can see how Inuit were connected to the environment, the birds, the animals, the land, everything was connected. And they were very spiritual and um, very connected to everything that they saw, that they, they lived in. So when I saw the King Eight fabric designs, I saw a lot, little bit of that. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna do something that's connecting both. So I started sketching this on my iPad and I tried to connect, but more modernized. So when you were sh being shown how they were being done before, everything was done by hand. Now in today's world, it's so much easier to do these things like, um, like digital painting, and then you can send it off by email, the, the image and have it printed on a fabric. It's so easy right now. And as Inuit, um, I'm seeing more of Inuit fashion designers doing this and it, it's like um, great pride that I see when I see other Inuit artists doing this. So when I was designing this, I was thinking of the environment, the birds, I saw a lot of birds. So I decided to incorporate that into my design and add more color. And everything that you see has white, back, white background, but I decided to do completely opposite, which is black. And um, with that design, I was thinking if I did a dress or an outfit, how would it look like? So I was thinking it should be from the 1950s and 60s era, because that's the fabrics that were done in that era. And I wanted to make it more into modern look. So with this uh, design I did, uh, it's, in, it's in the next slide. I sketched this out and I wanted to have an akuk, which is when you see an amauti, you can see the back of the amauti that looks like it has a long tail. So I wanted to do that, but make it more like anybody can use it. So I came up with this design and then I um, did the pattern and then I did the sewing and it turned out, do you have the, the next slide? So it turns out this way. So that's the fabric design I did and the look I wanted to see and make combine the 1950s, 60s era into more modern and more Inuit style. And um, so with my designs, I do a lot of um, Inuit designs with more modern look and more elegant look. And with this, this slide, you can see 
uh, the top, it has Inuit tattoos. And I did that design. And also the earrings and the necklace are all made out of seal skin. And this one, um, same, uh, same thinking. Uh, this, the front part is called Sekiaguti. And you, you, the women use that on their amauti. And it was like a decorative uh, um, piece that women wore and it was filled with beads. So I did uh, appliques and some chains and some more glamorous look to that um, look and also the sealskin um, skirt. With my artistic background, I was able to create this outfit with Inuit tattoos and Inuit goggles and Inuit earrings and make it more modern, modern look. So with the fabric designing, it's so much easier now to do however you want to do it. And I just came out with this one not too long ago. <clears throat> And it's for sale if anybody wants to buy. <laughs> Next. And I think that's it, eh? I can't remember. Yeah. So that's, that's me. And uh, that's all. That's <laughs> all. Thank you, Martha. It's so interesting and wonderful to hear uh, about what inspires you in your work and your practice and the influences that have shaped your work and in particular, um, the beautiful dress that we have on display downstairs in the museum right now, which we're thrilled to have as part of the exhibition. So thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jennifer Burgess and Dr. Norman Verano, whose essay is Even Banks Have Large Windows That All Need Drapes, Marketing Canada in Canite Textiles. Jennifer is a PhD candidate at Queen's University in the Department of Art History. Her current work explores the ways in which Inuit use textiles to navigate and negotiate their identities in a shifting, modernizing world. Norman is a scholar and curator in the area of Inuit art museums and indigenous modernisms. He also served as catalog advisor whose scholarship has greatly informed our research and vision for the project. Oh, hi, well, I'll, uh, <laughs> thank you. I, Jennifer and I will just uh, split up our time because I know we each have separate remarks, um, but I just wanna say and I hope everyone is staying safe. And I wanna begin by congratulating Roxanne and Anna for their vision and their determination to drive this project forward. And Emma Quinn and the entire staff at the uh, Textile Museum of Canada for their unflagging support of this very important project. And I wanna acknowledge all the contributors. It, it really is an honor to be part of this project with you all, particularly with the um, inspiring fashion designers and artists who are just so wonderfully central to this project. It is a real honor. I also, of course, want to acknowledge the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, uh, Will Hoffman and Paulusi Kongmagiak, and my sincere appreciation to all the artists, collaborators, contributors in Cape Dorset, who have so richly and generously shared their understanding with me over the years. And um, in particular, Kanangana uh, Putuguk, who passed away now 10 years ago, which is hard to believe, but he more than others um, really opened my eyes to the vibrant and dynamic history of Cape Dorset printmaking. And, and he really inspired me to uh, pursue the history of printmaking in Cape Dorset as a historical topic. And lastly, I want to thank um, my co-writer, Jennifer Burgess, who is writing her thesis on Inuit textiles and modernism at Queen's University. And it was a pleasure to write, write with her. I just had a few remarks, um, being um, considerate of the time here, um, about our essay. 
I, I want to, I guess, begin by saying that serendipity, it was a recurring feature in the story that I uh, explored in many strange ways. You, you can put on the slide. I don't know if the slides can go on, but yeah. Yeah. So that's the, the guy I wanted to <laughs> start off with, this guy, James Houston, whom I'm sure many people know here um, because of his impact in, in the North and as an author and um, certainly as, as a key figure in the uh, co-op and art making in Cape Dorset in the 1950s and 1960s. But, you know, strangely enough, um, Houston's own history is, is very interesting because he was the son of a traveling yard salesman and uh, his father worked for the W.R. Johnson and Company and would sell cloth across Canada in the 1920s and uh, the 19 teens and up to the 1930s. So in a way, Houston kind of knew fabrics going into his work as as uh, in in the studio, and that's a strange uh, part of the story that um, didn't really strike me until I started investigating, and then I reread some of the things that Houston wrote. And fabric is kind of all over in the metaphors that he draws upon. In one thing that he wrote, uh, he was talking about why he wanted to leave Toronto in the 1940s um, after the war, why he didn't sort of come back to Toronto where he was from. And he said, uh, he described Toronto as being the city where women wear tight girdles. And so it was like this kind of this old kind of fashioned kind of town in his view and wanted to go on. But serendipity plays more of a role because the guy that Houston um, kind of hired, he was, uh, Houston was working for the government as a civil administrator in Cape Dorset in the 50s. And the guy that uh, was appointed to him by the government was a guy named Bill Barry. And, um, and as it happens, and it was in 1958, and as it happens, Bill Barry's father was this guy by the name of Mac Barry, who was the head of the Primary Textile Institute of Canada and a major player in Canada's textile world. And so all of these serendipitous connections um, lastly, the title of our essay comes from John C. Patton, and uh, even banks have uh, windows that need drapery. And um, yeah, there he is right there. And uh, he was hired by Canadian Arctic producers to promote UPICS in the mid 1960s, and then hired on contract by a, a CAP to promote the Cape Dorset textiles. And he did this cross Canada tour in 1966 before uh, working to stage the textiles at Expo 67. And part of our essay was to look at how the textiles were received uh, in, at this promotional tour. And, uh, and, and I was really struck by the way the textiles defied Canadians' expectations of what Inuit art can be and how the co-op had to wrestle with what people's expectations would be um, about what Inuit art can be. And I'm sure that that's something that the artists and designers today can speak much more about in a, in a more personal way. Um, so that, that's the extent of the re remarks that I wanted to say. And I'm, I'm happy to turn it over to Jennifer who would, will have a few more comments, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Norman, and thank you to everybody. My name is Jennifer, and I'm speaking to, to you today from the traditional lands of the Ganyan Gahaga and Anishinaabeg peoples, also known as Montreal. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking particularly Emma Quinn, Roxanne Shaughnessy, and Alex Holm for inviting us to participate and contribute to this exciting and very timely project. Um, it's been such a privilege to work with the Textile Museum, the contributors to the catalog, and to everyone involved in making this exhibition and this project as a whole such a success. Um, it's so gratifying to know that important work like this is underway and that the wonderful and significant fabrics that we are already seeing a little bit today are receiving the attention and the care that they are due. Um, I'd like to express special gratitude to my co-contributor Norman for all of his work, time and support throughout this endeavor. It has been such a pleasure. Um, it's obviously very unfortunate that we can't meet with everyone today in person, uh, but I'm so grateful to be able to connect virtually and I look forward hopefully to the opportunity to meet and discuss this work with you in the future. Um, as has been said before, this project feels 
uh, like it's just the beginning of a, a much wider sort of wave, which is very exciting. Um, so I look forward to seeing everyone in the future when we can meet in person again. Thank you, everyone, Kleanamik, and congratulations. This is wonderful. All right, thank you so much, Jennifer and Norman, for your um, kind remarks today. And um, your research essay is an, an important contribution to this project that, that others can now build on. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is Nux Lindell, co-founder and lead designer at Hanani Design, um, a collaboration of created minded friends from the Kivalik region of Nunavut, this fashion brand is committed to promoting Inuit culture, language, and lifestyle. The brand is based in Arviat, which if we look on our map here, um, we can see it's one of the most Southern communities on the mainland of Nunavut. Um, and this is Nux's hometown and where he continues to work and live with his family. Uh, last summer, Roxanne and I interviewed Nux over the phone for the catalog, and he created a powerful design for the exhibition. Um, which I think he's going to speak about now. So uh, welcome, Nux. Hey, uh, Alex, thank you very much. And thank you every, everybody else for um, your presentations. And um, <clears throat> I think I'm off here. Um, and everybody else who's, who's um, Are you guys seeing me okay? It says my um, internet is unstable, but hopefully it's still um, it's still working fine. Um, maybe if we can focus on the um, the images. Um, yeah, if you guys don't know, our internet is very spotty here. Um, and I've also been trying to adjust my lighting as I'm, I'm losing daylight here. <laughs> um, so, E, thanks for the introduction. Keenan Nuxlindel, my mama, I'm a Avve, my daughter. Keenan Nuxlindel from Avve. I was really honored to be asked to be a part of this uh, amazing project, um, especially. Uh, finding out too who else was asked to be there. Um, really inspiring to be alongside Martha Kayak and uh, Tagalik, um, two amazing artists that I really um, enjoy uh, enjoy working with and look up to. Um, so when when I uh, I guess got asked to about this project. Um, I was really excited and I knew I wanted to do something um, outside my comfort zone. And so I, I did a lot of thinking about um, the art that was happening at the King Knight Studios back in the, um, the 60s and um, the Inuit art that has inspired me throughout my life. And um, yeah, trying to come up with an approach of how I'm going to do this. And I wanted to focus on um, the things I like the most about the Inuit art um, in general. Uh, a lot of it is wildlife based. And like Martha was saying, Inuit drew what was around them and what's important to them. And most of that is animals. We rely on animals so much as you can see in this picture here. Uh, that's this summer when we caught a beluga whale um, and getting the muktak off it that yeah keeps us uh, is a very important food for us and that gives us vitamin C um, during the the cold winters uh, when we really need it um, and so yeah some of the favorite parts of the Inuit art that I wanted to try and put into my work was the um, the characters. Like uh, Inuit often do animals, uh, but they often do animals with um, a lot of attitude and uh, or kind of cheeky and um, 
I really love that. So I wanted to create an, a, like an animal like that. Um, but also they, they did art to represent what, what they were going through at that time. And um, I wanted to focus on the main issues and what, what I'm going through right now. And um, it, I don't think it's changed much um, since the 60s. Uh, if um, you guys know your history, that um, that was the time of um, a lot of hardship for Inuit. That was a time of residential schools when the passing down of knowledge was taken away from Inuit. Um, and I struggle with that today. I struggle with my Inuktitut fluency. I grew up speaking mainly only Inuktitut until I moved to Ottawa, where it only took me about a year to almost nearly forget all of my Inuktitut. And it only took me like less than a year to learn English. So um, I've been trying to recover from that for the past like over 10 years. Uh, especially now that I have a five-year-old that I try to only speak to um, in Inuktitut. But it's difficult because we live, um, we live a life where we're, I, I feel like we're constantly having to fight for our culture, fight for our language. And I really want to create an image and a character that represented that. And um, the Siksik, the Arctic ground squirrel, is something that I felt like I feel like sometimes, and I, I really admire the animal. It doesn't really get much, um, it, it doesn't get much attention like the polar bear or the seal. Um, but I've always loved these animals, um, and you could see them running around everywhere yeah, in the Kivalik region, anyways, during the summertime. Um, we always used to hunt them as kids. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I feel like this, um, this image and this little character best represented how I feel about my culture and my, my language is um, um, having to fight, constantly fight for it, but it's a little sick sick and it's tiny. And that's how I feel sometimes, like you're trying to fight this um, um, something that is so large and that's so enveloped in, ev in everyday society, even now in the North, um, from the school systems to the economy, like everything is based on this like Western system, the Southern system that doesn't really work here, but we're kind of forced in it. And every day we're trying to keep eating Inu like Inuktitut and Inuit culture alive and it's tough and um, so this this um, this image represents my struggle of trying to keep my culture alive and um, this pink in the the sweater um, represents the the large um, like the opposition I would say I guess um i wanted to make it so close that it that people feel it that um like it feels too close like it feels like the six six should be should be running backwards but actually it's standing up and every part of it is like showing you that like from its toes to its tail to its um to its face <laughs> is telling you that it's not going to back down and that um it's going to fight till the end. And um, that style, I, I, uh, I tried to imitate the style of how it would be stone cut into, into the, um, uh, as that was one way that they used, Inuit used to, um, to do the prints was to carve it into the stone and then add the ink. And then, so I really like, I'm really interested in that technique and I actually tried to do it, but I really suck at working with soapstones, so I gave up pretty quick. Um, um, and um, yeah, so I, I just did a, the digital image and I was really agreeing with what Martha was saying, like it's very easy now to create the art. Um, 
and I often think about um, uh, when, I, when I'm doing my other art, like I do jewelry and knives as well. And I often think about how Inuit used to have to, uh, you know, make, make the same things, but with such a uh, few tools. And um, every day I think about the, uh, the resourcefulness of Inuit. And uh, that's what really inspires my work. And so when I do my jewelry, like these Kawatik headbands, they're made from uh, recycled aluminum from um, snowmobiles. And um, my earrings, uh, like the Nugyuk earrings are made from caribou antler, which is usually stuff that people throw out. Um, all my ulu handles are made from salvaged wood. And um, that really drives what I do is kind of using what's around me. And that's pretty much most, I feel like that's the most Inuk thing you could do because man, they made houses out of snow. Like <laughs> how fucking awesome is that? Uh, sorry for swearing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I put a lot of meaning into um, into this work and into um, into like all the all the designing that I tried to do. I try to always make it meaningful. And um, yeah, like learning more about um, learning more about this. Um, uh, this project, like getting to see the pictures is really cool, like uh, when Anna was talking and it's almost like, um, I don't know about you guys, but it feel like I could, I, I could smell it in there. Like you could see the, the big ashtray full of cigarettes and you could see uh, all the ink in the back. And then the guys are wearing like the super classy uh, gummies, but with the, the formal like uh, slacks and uh, dress shirt that like never goes out of style which is super cool so i like you could smell gummies they're made from um um bearded seal skin and that has a very strong smell and then yeah the smell of the inks in the background and like just getting to see all that as an artist i'm very interested in almost more of like the um the method as well as the final product so it's really cool to see that and to to get that book um, that you guys sent us about this project. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate having the stage where I could, um, yeah, make some art that really uh, allows me to express myself um, because I feel like I express myself way better through working with my hands and through my art rather than talking, as you might, <laughs> you might be able to see, I'm kind of stum stumbling all over the place. Um, so um, yeah, I'll just end it off with that, that I'm really appreciative. And um, to have the stage as uh, I think Alex said, like there's hundred something people watching. So um, and then more and more through your guys' Instagram page and through through your book, and um, so I, I really, I really thank you all for all the work you've done and research. And uh, um, I think, like you, like a lot of you said, this is really timely, um, and because uh, there's a big, um, there's a big rise right now. Um, um, of indigenous artwork, uh, indigenous people in general. I think we're on the rise right now because um, a, a lot of it is thanks to social media. Because we now can we now can you know tell our own stories, uh, whereas um, back in the day we weren't in positions to be able to share our stories with everybody. So now you're seeing a huge um, huge wave of Inuit art, Inuit music, or indigenous art, indigenous music. So, um, yeah, I'm just happy to be a prep. I'm just happy to. Yeah, thank you. Next, thank you so much for um, for elaborating not only on your um, contribution to the project and your interview, but um, sharing some other aspects of your experience. And thank you for your honesty. Um, I think that that was really meaningful um, for the project and for this presentation today and for everybody listening. So thank you. Um, our next speaker is another talented Inuk designer and artist, 
Tarka Duffy. She is a graphic artist, seamstress, jeweler, um, and writer now based between Salik, her hometown, and Saskatoon. Tarkalik's creative output shares distinctly Inuit experiences, often infused with a dose of humor and pop culture. Through her fashion brand, Ugly Fish, Tarkalik creates garments that make those experiences visible. Um, and she is also well known for her jewelry made from ethically harvested bones. Um, beluga vertebrae, caribou antler teeth, and other animal bones found in Nunavut. Last summer, Roxanne and I interviewed Tarkalik over uh, for the catalog over the phone, and she also created a powerful um, design for the uh, for the exhibition. So um, now I'm going to pass it over to Tarkalik, and she will she will um, elaborate. All right, Queen Namik Alex, nice to see you, and nice to see everyone. Um, I am also, I was also very honored to be asked to be part of this um, great collection and to contribute um, some art to it and conversations and um, I want to go back to what Martha was saying, how everyone's connected, which was interesting because she took McGill classes with my mother when I was a child and she would watch me while my mom was in school. So we would draw, I would draw, she'd always keep me entertained. And then Nooks, uh, he's also Taqalik, so he's my Taqalik, unless I'm mistaken, no. but he's my Abbaqaluk. No. So there's already connections between Inuit. There's like no six degrees of Kevin Bacon among us. <laughs> um, but I guess, what I wanted to touch on is uh, for me, it took a while for me to become proud of my culture uh, growing up in the 80s being um, Inuk and I was in, I was split myself in halves. And so I felt like there was always part of me that was at war with the other. And so it, in, when you grew up like that, I think you feel like you have to choose one side or the other. And uh, shamefully for a long time, I just decided to be Hadunak or white because I looked more white and people would always remind me how white I was. And so I think it took for me, it took me for me to move away from Nuna, um, almost a decade um, for my appreciation for my culture to come back. And um, my aunties used to talk about how they couldn't relax until, until they were flying home to their home community, they could really breathe. And when I was growing up, I'd be like, what? Like, I just wanted to get out. And so, um, but the longer I was away, it's like the land really truly does call you back. So your Inukness is really in your bones. And like, I guess the irony is you realize how Inuk you are the further away you wander from home. But then when I came back, my mom would say, uh, which is like, she's like this one, like everything moves her now. She thinks everything is beautiful because I would like take pictures of power lines or like fermenting fish heads in the porch or just like a piece of caribou on the road. Everything just became beautiful to me. My language, my culture, everything. And um, so that sort of is the foundation for a lot of my work. And then also um, realizing what our ancestors had available to them. Oh yeah, this is one of the pieces, it's power lines or that not one of the piece, <laughs> uh, power lines and there's so many things about Nunavut that are just visually um, seared into my memory and power lines is one of them. And I guess growing up, I would, it's something you didn't think you noticed, but um, they're everywhere. Driving up the road, you see them and around the community and we have no trees. And so they're sort of like the only big things sort of that are consistently along the land within the community, obviously not on the land. And uh, I guess I wanted to do this piece because um, if you look at the King, King Knight collection, they were surrounded by animals, you know, their stories. And for us as modern Inuit, we're surrounded by different things that we might not even realize. Uh, like for me, it was like the products on my grandmother's table too, like the click cans or the carnation, pilot biscuits, power lines. So these are the kinds of things that I kind of think about that maybe other people might not necessarily connect to Nunavut always, but uh, as far as the culture clash of colonialism like this, these are the things that have become a part of our everyday lives. And so with the artists that would um, <laughs> draw those beautiful prints with the things that surrounded their everyday lives, I wanted to sort of show like this difference of what we see in our everyday life as well. Um, so yeah, and 
I we used to always take those the 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 part on the bottom, the yellow part. You just like to th throw it up as far as you can up the power line. Um, I don't know if we have any other um, photos to show. Oh yeah. Also, as far as um, for me, I always draw things or create art that I just can't get out of my head. So for the longest time, I think for the leggings, I had this image of um, syllabics on clothing, sort of like wearing your, giving our language legs is sort of the tag that I had for that. Um, visibility of our language through fashion um, so we don't lose it. Um, like Nooks was saying, you know, it's, we're, we're just so bombarded with English and English things all the time. So I kind of wanted to combat that in a way. And it's just visually striking the, um, the syllabic alphabet. I mean, um, it's part of our early learning. Um, and for the beluga bones, <laughs> that was just something that I found was kind of magical. I was walking along the beach one day and two bones just exactly like that were washed up by my feet, like literally, and I picked them up and I'd never really seen them before. And I thought right away they would make beautiful earrings. And from that point on, it became kind of an obsession <laughs> to find the bones. Um, and as I was telling Alex um, in our conversations, at first I would just pick the ones that were kind of clean by nature. Um, but as I got more into it, I just, it, I started like just pulling straight spines off <laughs> the beach and dealing with maggots and like the grossest parts of an animal. But I think in that growing up in with elders working on skins, I just realized that was sort of a training to not be squeamish around things that um, would maybe otherwise be going to waste. Um, so yeah, my jewelry, um, jewelry work is really based in just taking things that would otherwise be wasted and uh, turning them into something beautiful. <laughs> so um, Zooms are so awkward because you can't hear anything, hey? Eh? So, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the biggest part of my practice, uh, like Nooks had touched on, just not wasting. Um, and how it really started for me was I would draw with my sister in her house. And then I remember thinking she had this Dremel that was just in her ports that she never used. She had it for a few years. And then there was some antler lying around. And I thought, how shameful that we have these things and we're not using them or doing anything with them. And I thought of all the people that would really love to have a Dremel, you know, at their, to, to be able to use. And so that's when I started um, making jewelry and, <laughs> Um, I didn't know how to like secure the bits properly. So the very first time I did it, like one went flying. Oh my God. It's, we're just very lucky that we have, I still have all my, um, my eyes and my fingers, <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, there was a, it was a great honor for me. I'm always, um, an emotionally based person and I just go by what inspires me. If ideas present themselves, I like to honor them. And so it was a, a great honor to be part of this project. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Taylor, for your contribution and for uh, being here today. It was really lovely to hear you speaking about, um, you know, other aspects of your practice and and things that inspire you and your experience as well. And I think um, it's a really strong note to end on. So Tarkalik was our last speaker uh, for today. Um, and now I think Roxanne will say a few closing words and acknowledgments um, before we jump into a Q&A. I think we have time for that. I hope so. I would like to um, thank all the contributors um, from the bottom of my heart, actually, um, for bringing your voices to these pages and for your research, ideas, reflections, memories, and wisdom that you've generously shared. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the creativity and resourcefulness of the artists and printmakers who produced these fabrics, these captivating fabrics in the 1950s and 60s. This important cultural material remains vibrant and relevant today, as we've seen tonight. Um, we look forward to bring, bringing the exhibition to Knight next year and making these fabrics accessible to the community and the families of the artists who created them. So the catalog is officially launched and our deepest gratitude to all who engaged with this project and supported our work. 
our own board of trustees, executive director Emma Quinn, our staff and volunteers. Thank you.